one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Today we are starting with why and finding room to forgive. Welcome to the revolution of one live stream. Every week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we are here at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we've got TK's two sets where I take two, three, two tweets, not two tweets, give a couple of thoughts about them, take you beyond 140 characters. And here on Wednesdays, Kamau and I talk with special guests about what's happening in the world and how you can make the most of your life. I'm excited about today's topic. Today, we have a guest, Dr. Charlie Cartwright. Dr. Charlie is the creator of the People Success Formula, which is a data-driven scientific approach to employee engagement, leadership, and workplace safety. He's one of the world's most recognized experts in these categories with over 30 years of experience working with organizations and individuals to help them crush it in all three of those areas. Dr. Cartwright, so glad to have you on. Welcome to the live stream. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here today. Hey, man, so I heard a really awesome rumor about you that you are a fellow Zig Ziglar fan. Is that right? This is true. Zig Ziglar was a life changer for me, so I'll, I'll never forget that. Never forget that. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I try to get everybody to, to do a sales job at least once in their lives. You know, I, I like to say you, you learn all the important lessons in life by trying to sell something, you know? Very true. Very true. Well, hey, you know, Kamal, when he introduced you to me, one of the things he did was he shared with me a bunch of your content, a bunch of podcasts, a bunch of videos. And there was one that really jumped out at me. And I love for this to be the starting point for our conversation. You made a video about why, about finding your why. And, and one of the things you said in that video is that, is, is that discipline comes from a sense of purpose, not the other way around. You know, you, once you know what your why is, then you know how to eat, then you know how to use your time and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I really thought that was a great insight. So I wanna, I wanna dive into your why and, and what is it that makes you get out of bed in the morning and, and, and what is your journey to even finding out what that is? That's a great question. You went, you went deep right away. You went deep right away <laughs> on me. Uh, my, <laughs> my why, it's so interesting because it goes way back, you know, all the way back to my childhood. And understanding I'm the descendant of faith, and I think back, back and uh, put myself right, and, and the thing they had to go through and endure so that I can be sitting in this chair to view. So I really take that seriously because at that time in our history, they had no hope or chance for what you and I are experiencing today. But somewhere there was a vision that this could be possible. And for them, they had to make sure that they endured, that they taught and they survived so that coming generations have an opportunity. Now, here we are many generations later and I feel a responsibility to match the opportunity that they paved the way for me to have, okay? Now, mm. in a greater context of humanity, I wanna make the planet a better place. Here, I wanna make sure that it made it difference and that I had a positive impact on anyone and everyone that I've come into contact with. So that's that's my why. It's a big one, but that, that's what drives me. Were there any moments in life where you felt in doubt about that or confused about that? Or is this just something you, you feel like you've always had? You've always had a sense of purpose. Yeah, I really had. A, there was a time I think, right, you know, I went to college and I, my whole mindset was going to college and playing major college football and, and going into professional football. And that was, that was I really had this focused uh, attention at it. And when that didn't work out, I was really lost, really lost because my entire identity was tied up in that. And I remember this story my grandfather told me about uh, World War II. He was a sergeant in the army in World War II, and the over he was stationed in England. That was the theater. Uh, he was in combat, and he said there were three planes coming back to the United States, and he wanted to get on the first plane, of course. And an MP prevented him from getting on the plane, pushed him in his chest, said, "Hey, you're on the next plane." And my grandfather pointed the plane, said, "No, I see room on there." He said, "I'm getting on there." 
And he said the MP pushed him. He said they actually got to a physical confrontation. He thought, hey, this guy's keeping me off that plane because he's prejudiced and this and that and the other thing. But he said, the guy said, I'm telling you right now, you're not getting on that plane. Didn't let him on the plane. Well, that plane went down in Iceland, killed everyone on board. And so the fact that my grandfather wasn't on that plane meant that he was supposed to be here and I'm supposed to be here, okay? So that was a moment that kind of recalibrated me a little bit, said, hey, I've, I'm supposed to be here and I've got to really go about finding what my purpose is and how I fit into the grand scheme. Yeah. Wow. If I could jump in, I, you know, one of the things that that I really have a connection with about Dr. Charlie is that we're family. Um, we, we literally come from the same Cartwright descendant. And so uh, this is a story that I've never heard before. But Dr. Charlie, you know, just to kind of add to TK's point real quick, if you could elaborate. I know, um, you you know, mo a lot of the kind of male figures of our family um especially you know on my on my dad's side and and the family in the midwest had troubled childhoods had uh parents who really didn't know all the proper parenthood mechanisms that we have today you know struggle with things like alcoholism struggle with things um just like abusive behavior so one of the things that i kind of know in your story and 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 knowing our family's history wanted to hear you kind of speak on is how do you think that you uh, you know, e even found purpose coming from such a, uh, you know, just traumatic childhood experience? Like, how did you kind of even see your way through the trees? You know, I, I kind of like this picture on the, uh, on the screen here. It's really hard to see your way through the trees when you're standing in the middle of the forest. So, you know, I, what was that like for you? Yeah, so I grew up, so in the mid 60s and, and beyond was my early childhood and so there was a lot of and i and i know we still have racism in our country but it was much more pronounced it was much worse back at that time so i experienced a lot of racism outside the household and then i had a father that was an alcoholic and uh, i remember one particular time he was violent alcoholic and so he's going to kill the whole family and he calls everybody in the living room and at the time, you know, the most powerful handguns in the world were a 357 Magnum and a 44 Magnum. So he gets his 44 Magnum out and he's waving it around and he actually puts it, you know, pull, puts it to my head and pulls the, you know, and pulls the trigger back. And I thought, you know, that's it. I'm probably 13, 14 years old at the time. And of course, he didn't pull the trigger. And I remember going to my room and I was really afraid. And uh, what was I going to do, right? My sister, I couldn't run away because my sister was down in the hall, down the hallway from me. So I told her to lock her door. And I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I said, well, I can sleep in the closet. No, because he just opened the door and see me. So then I came up with this plan. I would make my bed up really neatly, right? And because uh, I didn't want him to come in the, the room and kill me in, in the middle of the night in my sleep. So I remember making my bed up really neatly under the bed that night. So that way, if my dad burst into the room, he'd look at, think I never slept in and look in the closet, see I was never there and think I ran away. So that's kind of the backdrop of this traumatic childhood. But we had a family actually move into our town. It was a small town, uh, 36,000 people. And there's an African-American family that moved in and uh, they're from Houston, Texas. And the father was an executive at 3M and uh, and my friend's mother was in an RN, she was a nurse. And I remember going to their house and it was a very nice house and it was a landscape lawn and two nice cars in the driveway. And I remember watching his father and saying, I wanna be like him. That's the first time in my life I'd ever seen a white collar professional family and how they conducted themselves. So that man, <laughs> Little did he know, every time I was at the house, I was listening and watching. And that gave me, that showed me what was possible. And so that reshaped my focus and I went in that direction. Wow. You know, that that aspect of having someone to look up to, having someone that's, that's accessible to you, that kind of models what success looks like, I, I think that to me is one of the most underestimated aspects of 
of mentoring young people and, and, and even helping black communities, you know, because seeing someone that's like you who's made it to that next level makes you able to say this is more possible for myself. What would you say to somebody who who doesn't feel like they have accessible examples and everybody who seems like they're successful just seems like, oh, they've got all kinds of advantages I don't have or, or they're just from a completely different world than me. What would you say to them? Yeah, so the nice thing about with the internet now is we can access some really great people for free, right? I mean, if uh, if I wanted to talk to uh, Les Brown, for instance, and try to get him on the phone, it would be very difficult. But I can find YouTube and listen to his content for free and model the things that he's talking about. Same thing with Warren Buffett. You know, it probably takes seven figures to get him in my living room for a 30 minute or an hour long conversation, but I can get on YouTube and listen to him all day long and take all the great nuggets that he has out there available. Now, here's the thing about it is <laughs> trials and tribulation are, are part of the passage. You have to go through these things. There's no way around that. And anyone that's tremendously successful has had their own trials and tribulations, whether we know about them or not. So. We have to know that that's a part of the game and we have to understand that and then figure out the rules of the game and play by them better than anyone else. But trials and tribulations are a rite of passage and we have to go through them to get through that forest we talked about. You're gonna to have to go through difficulty to get to the end goal and you're gonna be tested as far as, do you really believe this? Do you really want this? You're gonna be tested. And, and many, many people, when they hit that test, they turn back. When really, when we experience temporary defeat, that's the time to push forward, readjust and push forward, and the victory is just on the other side of the ridge. But many people meet with temporary defeat and they treat it as permanent defeat and they never go back. How do you recognize it when you see it? When, when, when you finally stumble upon whatever that thing is, that thing that is your why, how do you know that you found it? That's a, that's a challenge. And here's the thing about it. And a friend of mine told me this, and it, it took a while for it to sink in. But he said, when you're operating in your gifts, it's no big deal to you. But everybody else says, wow, that's amazing what you did. I don't, I can't believe it. It could be the way you draw a picture or the way you words together or the way you mow a lawn, cut a lawn. You, when you're working in your gifts, it's so easy for you that you don't think it's a big deal, but it's hard to understand that other people can't do that. Other people can't duplicate that. I remember uh, or I'm putting PowerPoint presentations together and building content to give keynote addresses. And so I did a great workshop on it. So one of my students came to me. I took eight pages of notes. It was a wonderful workshop. He said, I went home, and together. And I realized this doesn't like what Dr. Charlie does it. This isn't come out right. right. You know what? That's just makes it look easy. So, so really gravitate to what flows naturally to you. Everyone has a gift. And that gift is so easy that you don't recognize that it's a gift. Man, that, that's funny you put that that way because we tend to treat our calling as this thing that's like really far out. And, and maybe we got to travel to the east or, you know, or something like that to find it. And what you're saying is, man, it is closer than you think. It's so close that you're probably missing it because it's that thing you take for granted. So sometimes you got to look at how other people are responding to you. You know, what's that thing that maybe doesn't even feel like hard work for you sometimes? That makes a lot of sense. I, I, I like to I like to use some of our some of my time with you to talk about a concept that I think is particularly challenging in 2020 and, and that's another thing i've heard you talk about which is forgiveness you, you you've talked about this as something that's valuable and i know in conversations that i've had with a lot of friends and a lot of students uh, a common question i get is you know aren't there some things that are unforgivable you know um what, what if you come from a home and, and your parents are really bad to you or you've got a friend that really betrayed you and you and you've been holding on to that for years and the hurt is is real is it really a good thing to forgive? So I want to know from you, first of all, what does it even mean to forgive? And, 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 and what's the case for why we should do it 
when you know when we're carrying around bitterness that that truly seems justified yeah that's uh this is one of the holy grails to life i think to have the fullest life we have to be forgiving human being to have the life to the fullest and so but it's because again these hurt real these are real things that really happen to us and we've all experienced it's a part of the human experience that we all go through unfair treatment in one form or another but the ability to get beyond that is the difference maker is the difference maker i mean literally when we hang on to anger when we hang on to hate when we hang on to those things it's literally eating away at our body like physically like we are more susceptible to illness, more susceptible to so many other diseases that are designed to attack us based on our stress response. And, uh, and also from a mental health standpoint, when we're hanging on to all those hurts, we're literally reliving them every time we recall them to our mind. So to forgive, it doesn't mean you forget because we learn from those, those hurts. We need to make sure that we don't repeat anything that would lead to somebody betraying us, treating or putting ourselves in a position where someone could mistreat us. So we've got to learn from it. But at the same time, we've got to move past it. Literally turn the page, turn the page. We're in a new chapter now. We're not reading that chapter anymore. We've learned from it, it served us, but now our future lies in the chapters ahead, not behind us. And so when we live in the past, we're not living in the future. We're not being present. So we're missing what's happening now. We're missing all this opportunity. We're missing all this joy and we're losing time by reliving those things. Cause it's, again, it's detrimental in every aspect of, of our life. There's not one benefit to not forgiving people, not one benefit. Dr. Carter, so we've got to understand that. We got to understand that and then uh, really re kind of a, uh, oh, Re, re use that energy. So it's interesting when we talk about energy, right? And life is energy. And the first rule of thermodynamics says that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be transfer, transformed or transferred. So we've got an opportunity when there's a hurt, we can transfer that into something positive or transform it into something positive, but we've got to keep it moving. Otherwise, it starts to, to hurt us. Mm, 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 mm. I really like that. So it, it's not about pretending that what happened is OK. It's not about pretending that being good and being bad is equal. It's about saying I'm not going to allow that to keep me stuck in the past. I'm not going to be held hostage by resentment. Is that is that a good understanding? OK, devil's 100 percent. And, and I really. I think, yeah. And I'm a real b big believer in it. I'm a real big believer in karma, right? And so, so how other people treat us, how they respond to that our karma, okay? And so for sure in these 56 years is that <laughs> karma keeps its appointments, okay? Oh, so, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. It, it it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna level out. So we don't have to be someone that's gonna go punish for making a mistake or mistreating us. Their activity is gonna punish. Us. So we've got to focus. We use that for positive good and to propel us into our future in a positive manner. Yeah, that that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I was gonna ask you a, a devil's advocate objection. I'm curious your thoughts on this. You know. Um, the, the fear of being a doormat, you know, if, if I develop a reputation for being a, a happy, healthy, optimistic guy, and no matter what people do to me, I'm going to adopt the best attitude. One, I also accumulate a, rep, a reputation of, oh, man, I can walk all over this guy. I can treat him however I want. How do you find that balance? Yeah, that's that's a good one, because I think it's often people mistake kindness for weakness and kindness is actually strength kindness is actually strength and if if you give someone an opportunity to get to know you and to form a relationship with you and they abuse that relationship 
it's, it's good to forgive them, but that doesn't mean you keep that relationship. You move them aside because we've really got to maintain our, the people at our table, they, we have to make sure that everybody that's in our inner circle is really supportive and on point. And so when people self-select themselves out of that circle, that's a good thing because then they freed that seat up for somebody to truly come in and support you. So it's a selection process. And so as people select themselves out, you'll get the right people around your table and then that'll propel you up even further and faster. Hmm. You Dr. Know, Charlie, one there's, of the there's something I wanted to ask. It's kind of actually going back a bit, uh, going back to the idea of starting with why. And uh, one of the things that you're known for is the culture doctor. That 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 is uh, one of the kind of like aliases you go by. And, and I, I think we're living in a really interesting time right now when it comes to uh, culture, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to, you know, all these things that are happening in society where uh, old, like, well, not necessarily old, but like racial tensions are kind of coming to head and people are are forced to deal with them and forced to experience them, um, sometimes for the first time in their life, uh, sometimes for the umpteenth time in their life, uh, but nonetheless, that they're happening. And so, especially, you know, all of us being black men, being in, in in black culture and in, in, in the direction that it's moving and how influential it can be. You know, one of the things that I was really curious about, you, you teach a lot of companies on how to build culture and how to create culture. But what if the culture doesn't necessarily fit the agenda that you want or that you see for your life? Um, you know, I, I, I'm almost a believer that people uh, shouldn't be afraid to go against the culture and not in the sense that, uh, you know, you're calling people out or, 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 or button pushing or in the sense that like, you don't use the culture as the status quo, that you use it as something that you can build on and you can kind of take uh, your individual expression and, and move it in whatever direction that you want to go in. And so I, I'd really be curious to hear you weigh in about the Kind of like using culture as the status quo and the thing that you have to do versus you know where you can find your individual expression and 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 use culture as something to kind of give air under your wings that's part of your question cut out yeah i um the last part was where, where where do you kind of fit in on uh, the the scale of culture? Do you part think of that question. this is that this is something um, that I guess should be looked at as the status quo, or is culture something uh, that you could use to motivate your individual expression, um, you know, of who you are and what you want to do? Am I still breaking up? Well, guys, it looks like it looks like Dr. Cartwright might be frozen for a little bit. So, Kamal, you and I can can riff for a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, I definitely can. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a real good question. It's it's really timely too, right? Because, man, forgiveness in twenty twenty is so different. I mean, something that people are battling with is is cancel culture. Or I've even seen. Yeah. Um, a number of like tweets being pulled up from things people have said five years ago, 10 years ago, and, and and people coming down hard on that and those people getting canceled. And it's like, okay, what do we do with this? There's a debate right now. Do we forgive that stuff? Or and what does it even mean to forgive that? All right, it looks like doctor's back. Dr. Cartwright, do you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, it's we'll, that, we'll it's that Midwestern that. internet. No, I'll just play. Yeah, right. Hey, man, one thing he said that I thought was, well, I, I want to hear him weigh in on that question, but one thing I thought he said that was really interesting in a, um, a video that he did about forgiveness was he talked about the relationship between forgiveness and finance. And he says for a lot of people, unforgiveness or being held hostage to the past is is, is the thing that holds their money up. Like it, it makes it harder for them to create wealth 
because they're they're flowing so much negative energy and they're focusing on what somebody else said to them or did in the past and, and, and they just can't free up that creative energy to be able to you know do the things they need to do to be be productive and be profitable i thought that was really interesting i hadn't heard anybody make a link between forgiveness and you know financial freedom before you know yeah definitely i i, I think also you know his story is so unique that um he had to forgive you know the people that he loves the most right he had to forgive his parents um i mean just the way he opened up the story about having a, a gun pointed to your head by your dad at 13 like how do you overcome that and i find it really interesting because it always seems like the people who've had the toughest times in life somehow use that um and make it um and and, and become these wonderful success stories and while they're probably a select few out of all the cases of you know really traumatic things happening to people, it, it's really interesting when you come across somebody like Dr. Cartwright, who who who's just had such a tough time um, and 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 was lost for so many years. Some of the things that he really hasn't got to dive into was that around that eighteen year old age, he was a football star. He used a lot of uh, the aggression um, and 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 the conflict that happened at such a young age, um, and he he took that out on the field, and he he was an excellent uh, football player because he played like he was mad. He played like he was going to take your your head off. And I think you know if you talk to him and, and looking at the guy we were just talking to a second ago, he's a completely different cat. He's 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 composed. He's mature. He he's happy. And I think you know being able to to take that forgiveness and integrate that and and, and build something beautiful from it right uh, to develop a skill set to develop a company and 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 then to help contribute to the culture in in a positive manner you know it, it's just amazing to take something so traumatic um and and then to you know to watch it bloom into something so much more productive and creative yeah, we over here bragging about you, Dr. Cartwright, how, hey, how all the stuff you've like been through, it. how you've been practicing what you've been preaching. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I want to hear your thoughts on that culture question that Kamal asked you. Were you able to hear him? Yeah, it was really choppy. Do you mind restating it? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it another go. Uh, essentially, that I think we're, we're living in a super interesting time right now. Uh, culture is... Uh, you know, depending on which culture you're plugged into, it is the dominant uh, force, you know, whether that is on media, whether that's on the news um, and us all being black men and being a part of black culture. I just I wanted to hear you kind of weigh in on it, being that you are the culture doctor. Do you think culture is something that sets the status quo or that something you know, allows for individual expression? You know, that's a great question. You're talking about within organizations? I, I, I'd say just at large, culture at large in the country. Like when I'm what I'm specifically talking about is like black culture. Like, are you allowed to uh, to be an individual and express yourself and uh, and and create and, and set your own direction, set your own path and create your own world? Or is culture something that you kind of should just um, kind of find where you fit in and plug into? Yeah, that's another that's another great question. So on the business side, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Companies are their culture. Okay. And so from an individual standpoint, we're talking about outside to the into the greater uh, good, then there are certain tr trailblazers that have been able to highly impact and establish a new culture, a new direction, right? Martin Luther King comes to comes to mind. He shifted the culture in the African-American community for good in the way that we uh, partnered with our Caucasian brothers and sisters, right? Uh, he was able to trailblaze that way. So I think that culture definitely has a certain momentum. However, certain individuals are powerful enough and have a powerful enough impact to create a movement to shift the trajectory in a, po a more positive direction. So I think that it's up to all of us every single person is a contributor to our culture and that's either positive or negative and so i want to be a person that's always pushing it in a positive direction 
and to have our culture represented in a positive light. I think that's hugely important. Whether I'm in this platform, I'm on the 10 o'clock news or someone sees me at Walmart or Target, they're going to get a sense of what I represent in a positive way. Doctor, one of the things that Kamau and I talked about was um, cancel culture, something that we've seen even just in the last couple of weeks. It's kind of been going on for at least a couple of years, but in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some big names like YouTube influencers, celebrities, like people or politicians, people pull up maybe like a racist tweet or a racist sounding tweet that they put out two years ago or five years ago or maybe like a comedy video that they made in blackface like five years ago, 10 years ago. And, and stuff is coming to the surface now under this current climate. Some of those people are handling it, you know, I, you know, brilliantly by just saying like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna own this and I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to, to show the world, um, you know, what a human being is capable of if they just own something. Uh, some have defended themselves. Some have like been canceled and gone away and so it's, it's given rise to this debate, like, hey, should we forgive stuff like that? If we can pull up a tweet that somebody said five years ago, 10 years ago, where they said something inappropriate or insensitive, how, like what role does forgiveness play in the cultural conversations we're having about those sorts of things? Great, another great question. I think we definitely need to give people an opportunity to make mistakes and to make amends. That's, that's, that's a big part of it. I remember what has been a month or so ago, maybe six weeks ago, a NASCAR uh, driver was in a virtual race and he was talking to his spotter, uh, a white man, and the, the driver was, I believe he was part Caucasian, part Asian. And so he, when he was trying to get his spotter's attention, he thought it was just the two of them on the radio and he used the end. It wasn't just the two of them on the radio, it went, through this live broadcast, okay? And <clears throat> so he ends up, all the sponsors fired him, and then and then his NASCAR team fired him. All within maybe 24 hours, he put out an apology and things like that. And I thought that, I mean, he wasn't, I don't, I don't believe that word should ever be used by any race. That's my opinion on that. However, he wasn't using it towards an African-American person. He wasn't using it in a vile way. And obviously there was some banter between the two of them, not saying it's right, but I felt like that was a, such a severe consequence for, for saying one, one word when I think he should have been able to make amends, take a, take a three month suspension, something like that, and get back to his career. His whole life has been about getting to that point and his life shouldn't be destroyed by making a mistake. We've gotta be able to, as human beings, allow to make mistakes understand, have it brought to her attention, and then move forward. But this cancel culture, what it does is it drives people further underground. They're actually afraid to engage in a meaningful discussion because, hey, if I say the wrong thing, someone's going to jump down my throat or it's going to end up on, on some type of social media platform and I can lose my job, lose my career. So therefore, I'm not going to say anything. And that's exactly the opposite of what we need to take place. We need a more open, robust dialogue where people can speak freely and we can come to mutual understandings and grow closer together rather than the cancel culture, which drives us further apart. You know, when I, when I think about that, it, it, it makes me think of how when we go from one extreme to the other or when we're trying to correct an extreme, we tend to go to the opposite extreme before we can find that middle ground. And what this makes me think about is that society is kind of in the process right now of, of, of sorting out this other side of forgiveness. Because one side is, is challenging ourselves to let things go, but then the other side is challenging other people to level up, right? And, and so you can't have forgiveness without the willingness to hold other people accountable to the right thing. You know, So for me to say, hey man, I'm gonna let this go and we're gonna move past this also involves me challenging you to take ownership for the bad things that you've done, to acknowledge that there are real consequences to that. And, and, and I think that's something that we're trying to figure out what the right balance of that is. I, I think in many ways, this is new for us where, where, where the average person, like you said, like you can go on Twitter or YouTube 
And you can learn from Les Brown when 30 years ago, you had to actually have that in your network. You had to know a lot of people. And in a similar way, we can go on Twitter and we can hold the celebrity accountable for something inappropriate they said, even if you don't have a following, even if you don't have you know any influence, you can ruin somebody's career you know, just from your living room. And I think that kind of power is new for us. And, and like with any form of power, it takes some time, it takes some practice to figure out what the best use of that is. And, I'm, and I, I think we're in the process of trying to figure that out as a culture. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Yes. Speaking of culture, I, I like to talk about internal culture, culture at the individual level, mindset. Um, I, I like to talk about this under the banner of like working under stress. And, and, and we don't have to think of it just in terms of going to your job, but even just your everyday work to, to get through life, to, to interact with your family. Um, I want to talk about mental health. I, I want to talk about coping with anxiety and all those sorts of things. We're, we're at a time where there's so many factors going on that's making people feel anxious. I mean, you know, people are wondering, you know, when they can get back to work or, or when they can get business going like it used to be. So there's financial uh, anxiety. There's anxiety over COVID-19. Are we healthy? Then there's political anxiety with the election coming up. There's racial anxiety with this national debate. I, I, I want to hear you speak to the people for a little bit about the importance of mental health and how to maintain a constructive focus when it feels like you have so little control over your, your mobility, over you know what's being flooded into your senses via the media and so forth. Yes, this is such an important topic. I'm glad you're asking this question because the body definitely follows the mind. Okay, so, and not vice versa. So our mental health game, we've got to really raise that to a much higher level than ever before because all the things you stated are true. And so we're under more stress as a nation, as an individual, than really going back to wartime, World War II, World War I. That's probably the level of stress that everyone is under right now. So I think one of the big things is to really be mindful and conscious about what we're feeding our mind. What are we feeding it every day? We know uh, from a physical standpoint, if we get up every day and we just live on chips and donuts and candy and soda pop, we know over time we would be really unhealthy from a physical standpoint. But people don't put the same emphasis on mental health as they do on physical health. You look at all the things that people are feeding their minds on a daily basis, and a lot of them are negative, right? And so how can you continue to feed your mind all these negative inputs and then expect it to be healthy on the other side of that? It's really not, it's really not practical and it's really not possible. So I think that's huge that it's something that you have to be mindfully putting positives into your, your mind every day every day throughout the day not reading for 15 minutes before you go to bed or reading 15 minutes when you awake you've got to permeate your mind with positivity and one way to do that is keep the negativity out i mean there's we can't do anything about politics in russia we can't do anything about politics in iran not in our our, our standpoint but people are feeding their themselves all this information what's happening in china we don't have an impact on that so why would i take up bandwidth worrying about things that I have absolutely no power over. So I've got to really mind my, my mind, my own mind, my own house first and foremost, then I'll have some bandwidth to do some other things. But we're a flooded, if you look at CNN, Fox News, Yahoo, you name it, a really high percentage of that content has got a negative spin it's 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 fear mongering or so many negatives to it and it's just not healthy so i keep you know i keep books with me all the time you know that i'm that i'm uh that i'm reading and and throughout the day um and i'm putting positive information into my mind every day and that's how i stay positive but if you get in this new cycle and are reading these things every day people are really in a sense being manipulated with not outright lies, I wouldn't say that, but 
definitely a lot of partial truths. Certain information is given without the rest of the story and the context isn't there and it takes people down a certain path. So we have to be smart about this and we have to do things that we can do to manage our stress, like exercising, getting our rest, proper nutrition. And that's not only in your body, but in our, in our mind, what we're putting in there. Doc, I wanted you to kind of talk about um, this this aspect of the crucible. I know that's something in private conversations, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about. And I think in many times in your life uh, as a family man, as a leader of a company, um, even as a consultant who's trying to uh, turn the ship around, who's, who's trying to get people to uh, see a new light, move in, in a new direction. I think you've been able to work under pressure um, very successfully. And, and, and I'd like you to kind of shine some light on, on what does that process look like for you? Uh, what, you know, when so many people are counting on you uh, to pull through, you know, how do you respond to the pressure? And, and what does pressure do for people in general? Uh, does it build diamonds or does it burst pipes? Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's interesting. It's a great concept. You think about what pressure does to people and really, when we face pressure, there's a choice. You know, are we going to this pressure? Are we going to let it crush us? Or are we going to be like a diamond and be hardened and strengthened and beautified by the same pressure, same pressure that, that, that crushes people, creates diamonds. It's the exact same pressure. The difference is we make. And choose to lose. <laughs> are we going to choose to to grow and flourish? And my choice is to, to grow and, and flourish. It's a choice. And I feel stress like everyone else feels stress. I feel pain. I feel disappointment. I feel all those things like everybody feels those things. So it's easy when we're feeling a high level of stress or anxiety to feel like, oh, no one feels it like I do. Oh, we all feel that. But the difference is what we choose to do with it. And so how we use that pressure and stress to, to build us stronger. And so I know that whenever I'm faced with challenges, I know that when I overcome, not if I overcome the challenge, when I overcome the challenge, then I'm going to be stronger on the other side of it. And every time I overcome a challenge, my confidence level goes up and it goes up and it goes up and it goes up. And so true confidence is earned. No one can, can give it to us. And, it's something that we we grow by going through adversity. And so you gave the example and I like to use of the crucible. And I remember science class, we would we would have these crucibles and this crucible was was uh, able to take hundreds and hundreds of degrees of temperature. And you put a chemical or liquid inside the, the crucible and put it under a fire and it would burn off everything but the true but what 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 was left really mattered in that crucible, right? You burn off all the the extras, all the fluff, and what was left was the true matter that you needed. And so that's what pressure does to, to, to human beings. And it separates leaders uh, from followers and it separates successful from not successful. And so being able to navigate that is the key to success. And there's only one way to learn how to navigate it, and that's to go right through it, not to avoid it, but to go right through it and to learn along the way and know that you're not alone and that if you can navigate that course that on the other side of it you're going to be a better stronger human being it's not easy and so we got to know it's not going to be easy but it's doable and it's necessary and again our ancestors were sitting here because they were able to make it through that they went through that fire and came out on the other end so we had a chance and now here we are in 2020 with so much stress same time, so much opportunity, all balled into one world. And what we choose to do is going to make the difference. Mm. You know, this, this ties in to your first point about the power of why. Because when, when you talk about that crucible, that's a very, that's a very purpose oriented interpretation of the process, you know, and, and when you're going through suffering, if you just see your suffering as like these random bad things that are happening to you, divorced from some sense of a purpose, a calling, a mission, or a why, 
you, you don't get to see that meaning in that story, right? But you see the meaning in the analogy when you say, well, well, there's an end to this. And that end is what I'm working towards. That end is what my life is about. That end is my why. And, and I'm, I'm capable of going through this because I'm going somewhere beyond the moment, you know? And, and so I think your point about finding your why, it not only gives you the motivation to get out of bed in the morning, it not only gives you the strength to forgive, but it gives you the capacity to see meaning in the suffering. I, I think that's just a perfect tie-in with, with where you began. I think that's a beautiful point. Yeah, it. Uh, I remember, I still remember my grandparents on my mother's side and my grandfather, you know, sergeant in the army, World War II, is a union steward, 30 years at the post office. My grandmother was an entrepreneur. She cleaned houses for wealthy people. And then when I got into middle school and high school, I helped her clean office building, an office, a large office building. And, you know, they had very simple lives. But a big part of their life was making sure that I had the knowledge that I needed to take another step and beyond that they were able, then they were able to take. And so I really want to, I'm really interested in honoring their memory and I'm interested in honoring every single dollar they made and put towards me. I'm interested in honoring every single minute that they invested in me. And for me to do anything else is unacceptable. Mm. You know, Doc, That's I hard. wanted to see if I can uh, throw you a curveball. One of the I uh, one of the things we talked about. I I, I told you to prepare for a curveball, so here's it coming. <laughs> um, you, just kind of building on your last point, talking about the importance of uh you know being able to build on that generation and then and what it's like to be in the crucible of the pressure and that our ancestors had to go through that and i think one of the things that is really cool about your story is that you're, you're almost from a child it seems like you've been in that pressure cooker especially your early days um i'd say probably till around 40 you you've been in that pressure cooker um, where you had to work, you had to grow up in a tough environment that was uh, right after kind of civil rights and and had to go through uh, the the everything that came with that. I think when, uh, you know, you, you kind of started to grow up and, and you were in your preteen years, that experiences with your father and, and, and just the pressures of being at home. And then, you know, football, of course, you know, playing at such a high level and then going on and, and being an executive for organizations like UPS and, and FedEx that are very fast paced um, environments that it, it's all about efficiency. And so I think you've got used to being in that in that crucible and and you've been able to kind of th uh, th uh, flourish and, and and develop yourself in, into something um, that that that's a gift that keeps on giving that shows other people ways on on how to get through that. So my question or something I'd just kind of like you to touch on is one of the things that's pretty near and dear to you is this concept of the Cartwright Family Fund, where you are essentially building something for uh, our family that should be should be a uh, a nest egg of resources that can help the next generation that that can help. Um, you know, people like myself or people like my siblings or people like your son or his or his kids. And, you know, just and 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 and, and to build something that that keeps on giving and and to essentially empower people that come from our bloodline and our family to continue to do so. And I and I think the concept is really interesting and, and it doesn't seem like it's just the traditional family trust that that that's your goal. It's, it's just about money, but it's it's really about empowering people. So I'd really like you to, to share more about what is your mission behind that? What's your purpose and what is your why? And, and how does that uh, how does that tie into it? Yeah, that's a great question. That is a curveball. I wasn't expecting that one. So mm -hmm. this goes back to matter of fact, it was that that family picnic where you and I first met. And I remember looking over at one of my cousins and one of my aunts 
And there were five girls, five women from age one all the way up to age. I think my aunt was probably 80, maybe 80 years old at that time. So that's five generations of women there. And there was not one man anywhere in the picture. Okay. And I was like, man, I really saw these generational habits front and center that I've got dysfunction in an 80 year old. Then I've got dysfunction in a 60 year old. Then I got dysfunction in a 40 year old and on down. And so it just hit me that the solution to the dysfunction is education. So I want to, my, my, overarching goal is setting up this endowment where anyone from our family can go get their education, right? Have their, their books, their tuition paid for. And I just have this picture in my mind of a young teenage girl getting pregnant. She's pregnant at 15, like my mother was, and my mother had me at 16. And then she's got a little girl that she's sending to school first day of kindergarten. And she says, <clears throat> she's gonna say to this little girl, if you get good grades and you stay out of and you stay out of trouble, you can go to college. And that little girl is gonna get in her kindergarten class that morning and say, I'm going to college. I'm going to college. That's what I see. That's the vision. And just the education piece alone, people from our family are going to bump into other people. And some of these people are going to go on to, to do great things. And they're going to say, wait a minute, I was in college with him and I had better grades. How is he doing all that? Let me see what I can do. And it'll really start to change the culture within our, our family. So that's, that's my vision. And, you know, before my time is up on this planet, that will happen. That will become a reality. Yeah, I, uh, I I think, you know, it, 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 it's something that I knew that was super near and dear to you. And, and I think that it, it, it's not unique to you. I don't, I don't think the position of, of being in this crucible is something that only you uh, have had to go through. I, I know there's a lot of families and a lot of communities um, that there are individuals that seem to be uh, this beacon of light, this beacon of hope especially in, in, in communities of color. And I think uh, in large part, that is some of um, the pressure that I've felt kind of coming up and, and, and stepping into my own and, 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 and starting to build my own career is, is that you are this beacon of light. And, and what that represents is we're counting on you. We're counting on you to do your thing at the highest level to then help and, and, and pull another up. And so I just find it really interesting speaking to somebody else who, who's closer to that, right, in their lifetime than I am, um, and, and who's kind of trailblazing that path forward. Because I think for, you know, society, social media, uh, branding, it, it doesn't seem to even make a, a drop in the bucket. Like, it, it's not about that. It's, it's about a, lo a lot smaller scale and, and the people who you're related to, the people in your community, that neighbor who was across the street from you and that dad who was cutting grass, that's what he represented for you. And I think that's kind of, uh, you know, what, what the point I'm trying to speak to is, you know, these 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 strong individuals in, in smaller communities and families that the amount of impact that they can have is 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 unparalleled and that can and that it can uplift an entire generation um, just from them realizing and uh, starting their own revolution. 100 percent, 100 percent true. There is no small act that doesn't have a, a giant ripple behind it. And so the more positive ripples we make, the more positive uh, outcomes we're going to have in our communities uh, all around the country and all around the world for that matter. Dr. Cartwright, for the people that want to know more about you, that want to follow your work, what's the best place for them to look? You can find me at uh, Dr. Charlie Cartwright on LinkedIn. Um, also, you can follow People Success Labs, the website we have. And uh, But yeah, if you, you Google Dr. Charlie Cartwright, 
There'll be a lot of content out there. You can get in touch with me and we can interact. I would love it. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today and share your story, share your thoughts. I hope this message travels far and wide. Um, meeting people like you and seeing the work that you do gives me a lot of hope for our world. Um, you know, sometimes media paints a very dark picture, a very bleak picture. Um, but but knowing that there are mentors and heroes that are investing in building people up um, gives me a reason to keep going. And I'm sure Kamal feels the same. So thank you so much and, and, and keep doing what you do. For having me. Appreciate it. So. All right, everybody. Join us tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time for TK's Two Cents. We're here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, Revolution of One live stream, 12 Eastern time. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.